0517 the queen of sheba saskatchewan saskatchewan canada heavenly father we thank thee tonight for the privilege that we have of coming into thy presence we thank thee for the lord jesus who has brought us together and assembling us here one more time before the the great coming of his presence and we ask that you will bless us tonight in the feeble efforts that we put forth in doing thy commission that thou hast commissioned us to go into the other world disciple all the nations and signs would follow the believers we pray that we manifest your resurrection and your great word tonight in our midst forgive us of all our sins as we stand tonight lord as the people who realize that we're not worthy to even call upon you but by grace thou hast redeemed us and we love you for it and at one time we were counted aliens away from God without hope without life but Christ died the just for the unjust and through the reconciliation of his death we have been brought nigh unto God in so much that we are called sons and daughters of God it does not yet appear what we shall be in the final end but we know we'll have a body like his on glorious body for we shall see him as he is and in the face of all this lord as we look to thee tonight bless our efforts and help us to keep manifest his love to others we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. May be seated. It's a great privilege to be here again tonight in the presence of this company and in the presence of the living God. And it's always a great thing to speak to our hearts as we speak of his blessed presence and speak of his doings and what he has done for us. And we are very grateful to him. And now this is the second night of our gathering and it's the weather has been a little against us and we are not having any certain sponsorship. We have come independent. We have come for fellowship with one another with the blood of the Lord Jesus, God's Son, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. He threw open the door for everybody, whosoever will. It will soon, I guess, it will be sailing across the seas for another world mission around the world for my fifth time. And it's been very strange in our homelands here, but the people, it certainly has alarmed my emotions to see, not speaking of any certain group or so forth, but of the general public, of the coldness and the indifference the church is becoming. On the north american continent in our country and in canada a few years ago i came into canada here and we had a meeting the tinsel was all on the meetings and people gathered to places to where the newspapers had to uh, report of people driving as many as three thousand miles by taxi cab just to be in the presence of the outpouring of the spirit and tonight after much advertisement and trying to cooperate with everybody and showing the same spirit that we did when we come when we first come Yet it's hard to get a little group of people to fill a little small arena like this. Then you could uh, wonder why it is that ministers' hearts are alarmed. In Africa, our first gathering was better than a hundred thousand. And in one meeting alone, 30,000 Rohisans accept Christ as Savior. Bombay, India, it was estimated of 500,000 at the meeting. There's no way to get them in one certain place. They wouldn't let us have it outside the city because that a lady had been there just before me a lady minister and she had uh, not any criticism to the lady remember because i have my first time knowing in my heart to ever criticize a servant of god that there's many times i may disagree with their behavior or try to talk to them or maybe some doctrine like that they might be preaching that i might speak with them that i didn't understand they might be right on the, in their doctrine the lutheran the presbyterian and so forth i just don't understand why that they do not accept the full gospel i do not talk about my brethren and then along in the full gospel rank there's many doctrines that i might not agree with you and i but i never try to be fellowship with any brother anywhere but the lady has caused some trouble caused two men to be killed starved to death in a riot and they made me hold the meeting inside the city and i was only got about two nights and the tremendous crowd till they were smothering each other to death laying on courts and piled in the streets and everything until I had to leave. Now Brother Tommy Osborne told me that my ministry, if I come, that in Tokyo this coming summer, that he expected at least two or three million converts. The ministry the Lord has given me seemed like it went over the head of the pe educated people. We educated people, but in the lands where they still have it's taught it's not taught and they believe that God is real, we accept him in the oh a mental conception they have to have a reality and when they see it that settles it tens of thousands swarms to christ in one altar call 
and the same message, the same effort that we would put forth, maybe for here, maybe 200 people or 300, whatever it would be here tonight, where maybe five or six tonight can come to Christ, where with that same effort across the seas will bring 100,000 to Christ. See, that's the difference. See, the revival has left our country. We just as, might as well face it. In our breakfast a few months ago with Billy Graham, one of the world noted evangelists, a wonderful character, a great man of God, I had the privilege of shaking his hand. Our paths have crossed many places at Zurich, Switzerland. He hit it on Saturday evening. I begin the same place on Sunday night, Sunday morning to start. I wasn't there, my plane never landed quick enough till I could get a cab and get to the grounds. But I turned the radio on and I could hear him. And many times our paths has crossed and he never got to shake hands till he was in Louisville, Kentucky, across from my hometown. There I shook his hand. It's always a privilege for me to meet men of God. And I had him that morning as he raked the combed those ministers, how they reproved them in the name of the Lord by the Bible. And he said, I go into a city and work hard and try my best to bring people to Christ. And when they give out the decision card, said, you ministers write them a letter instead of going, giving them a good warm handshake, saying, and I come back in a year from then, why I had 10,000 converts, I don't have 10. What's the matter? He said, it's because of your ministers. I sat there, my heart swelling and going down. I felt sorry for the man, not yet over 40-something years old, turning gray. And I know it's hard away from his family. I sympathize with him as a servant of Christ. But I thought, Brother Graham, if you only knew what you do, but you're burning out, but you're combing through waters that's already been combed, from across the country, from place to place, going have a great revival, thousands comes up and accept Christ in another year, none of them hardly. Just a meager little few. Remember, the called out of God is the elected. He said the kingdoms like a man that went forth and cast a net into the sea. And when he brought them in, he had all kinds in there. He had crawfish, mud turtles, snappers, he had serpents, he had lizards, frogs, he had scavenger fish, and he had real fish. Only thing the minister is doing is sinning with the gospel net. Whatever it was, all of them caught in the gospel net. But the nature of him, let him lay there a little while. If he's a frog, he'll jump right away. If he's a turtle, just isn't. But a few minutes till he says, well, there ain't nothing in this anymore. Anyhow, right back to the mud hole he goes. A crawfish will say, well, I tell you, it seemed like it was all right. But I tell you, I just don't see he's a crawfish to begin with. You can't make nothing else out of him. Christ never died just to let people have sympathy. Christ, God doesn't run his office that loose. You wouldn't run your office that loose. Christ never came from heaven saying, well, I'll die and perhaps maybe people will feel sorry for me and come. No, sir. Christ died to call the election that God elected before the foundation of the world. And them alone. Jesus said, no man can come to me except my father draws him. And all that comes to me, I'll give him everlasting life and raise him up at the last day. There you are. See, Christ died. To save those who God had, by foreknowledge, known would be saved. And so when, it's a pitiful sight, but why does this happen, friend? It's because that this condition has to come. There's an atomic bomb laying yonder to settle the difference. And that's right. God can't pour out his judgments upon just people. And his mercy has sought and pulled and different types of evangelists, the kind with the resurrected Christ, with the miracles. Then with the intellectual, he's called from every angle that he can be just called just because he's give every man a chance. The radio, the television, and everything, the blast of newspaper, evangelists in the corners, and it's swept. And continually we grow weaker and weaker by the hour. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. It's just the hour. There's nothing can stop it. All the preaching I could do, and all the resurrection that Christ could show, and everything will never stop it. The Bible said, but here's what we're responsible for, giving a great voice against the wrong. That's right. I could never stop ladies from wearing little old vulgar clothes. It's the nature of them. They already seen it. The devil presented it. They were the subject to it. 
I could never stop men from drinking. Certainly not. I could never make the church spiritual. All the preaching I would do, it would never make it spiritual. But there will be one now, and then that's a fish. God wants him in the kingdom. I'll give him a voice. I don't know who it is, but I'll preach it. And as I preach it, he'll hear you from the Father has given me will come to me. That's right. And that's why I'm here. I'm combing again. I hope as soon as I come back from overseas to comb Canada completely through again, I want in the generation that I'll raise with to stand there and say, I haven't shunned to declare the whole counsel of God as I knew it. Then the blood of the people would not be upon me. And then if God has sent his message and he's combed the cities and showed the wonders and signs and everything else, and then the people continue to go in on in sin, their first hope. I don't say this about Canada. I've said many times, if I was a young man and they would let me, I'd make my home in Canada. I love Canada. But I believe that our little nation below us here, even motherhood has stopped to a place till it's a past redemption. I don't mean that all mothers down there is not mothers. I don't mean that. I don't mean that any, not any good people, but the wicked has overruled it to a place. Till if the Christ doesn't come soon, there will be no flesh saved for the rapture. The hour is at hand. You have escaped a lot of it. But the television and the radio has blasted it right into your nation here. And I see your souls and the things becoming polluted and the people is becoming the same way. Oh, spiritual people, arise, awake. The hour is at hand. I never come to preach prophecy. Let us pray. Blessed Father, tonight, now as you open the word, speak to us. Let it be known, Lord. That thou art Christ, the Son of God, and no matter how wicked the people are, it's only to fulfill your blessed word. And way the righteous see the name of the Lord is a mighty tower, and they run into it and are safe. O oh, blessed Redeemer, help us tonight to understand as we go into the word. Let the Holy Spirit take the things of God and deliver them to each heart as we have need of. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I wish to read tonight just for a quotation of the scripture, and tomorrow night, if the Lord is willing, I've got a message that's come on my heart in the last few days on my road up here that I'm trusting that tomorrow in my room that the Lord will let me speak on it. Tomorrow night, I trust that he will. Tonight, it seemed good to the Spirit that I should speak a few words on Matthew, the 12th chapter and the 42nd verse just by way of introducing. And tonight, I shall do something in my services tonight, the Lord willing, by a revelation that come to me in Maine last week and this is the first time I am to undergo to try to do these things the way that I was instructed to my honest and sincere belief by the Holy Spirit that was in my room about three weeks ago or hardly long now the reading of the scripture Matthew twelve forty two, and the Queen of the South shall rise up in the day of the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And I want to speak on this great instance in the setting of the scripture tonight. The Lord Jesus has been upbraiding the Pharisees because that they would not repent. And they come to him and said, Master, we seek a sign from thee. And I hope that my congregation tonight can clearly understand that they have already received many signs, but they did not believe them. If they'd, Jesus said, uh, had said, if you hadn't known me, you would have known my day. For the scripture plainly had spoken out of the kind of signs that would follow the Messiah. Last evening we spoke on some of those, how that Philip recognized the sign of the Messiah and went to Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, being a member of the church in that day, as soon as that great outstanding sign was done before him, if anyone can remember, it was because Jesus said, before Philip called you, I saw you. And Nathaniel said quickly, recognize that to be the Messiah. And he said, Thou art the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, Because I told you that you have believed me, you can see greater things than this. Then we took to the fourth chapter and found out there that a man of another nation she came. And oh, if we had only had the time to go into it to notice that the first one to recognize that sign was a Jew. The gospel went to the Jew first, and the Jew there represented the remnant of the 144,000 that should be called in the last days, which is returning into Jerusalem. Now by the thousands he received the Messiah at his coming for his bride. 
and the second time this miracle was performed was on a Samaritan, a woman, a castaway, a type of the gentle church, a castaway, and she said, after a little talk with him, he asked her for a drink, and she, and so forth. And then he said, go call your husband. She said, I have none. That's true with the gentle church. They called out the mixed breed, and they said, thou hast said right, because you have got five husbands, and as quick as he told her that she had five husbands, she quickly, those big bright eyes sparkled and looked at him and said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet, for we know, there you are, we the Samaritans know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. But she couldn't understand who he was. He said, I am he that speaks with you. Now if that sign was done before the Jew and before the Samaritan, there's only one class left, that's the Gentile, and the resurrected Christ is obligated to perform the same sign before the Gentiles. Couldn't you believe him? Now, these Pharisees in our text tonight said, we seek a sign. And I want you to notice the sign, he said. It's in a weak and an adulterous, see, the Samaritan woman, a weak and an adulterous generation that seeks after the sign. If there shall be no sign given them, but as Jonas, I might pull out for you. Would you cut that, I believe? I just a little bit too much volume, perhaps. Is that better? If it is, raise up your hand if that's better. Was it better the other way? Raise up your hand. All right. Raise it up just a little. Not loud enough. All right. Now step it up a little. How's that? Someone says it's good. Why? Fine. Good. Jesus said that a weak and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And the sign that would be given them would be the sign of Jonas the prophet laid in the belly of the whale for three days and nights and come out. And that would be the sign given. The sign of the resurrection would be the sign. And if today, the day that we live in, that there's so much said about signs and there's so much such jealousies about signs, and if you'll notice, it doesn't only lay in the church, but it lays in the realms of the scientific world or the professional world. For instance, the medical doctor say, you do not need an operation, don't go over there, for he's nothing but a butcher. And the surgeon will turn around and say, don't take those sugar pills, you need an operation. The osteopathic will say about the chiropractic, he will break your neck. And the chiropractor will say to the osteopath, what good does it do to rub the outside? You have to get to the inside. The preacher will say the Methodist has nothing to do with it. We Baptists got it. The Pentecostal have said the Apostolics don't even know the Bible and vice versa. Our evangelists has the word. They are the gifted men. And the doctors will say the preacher ought not to practice divine healing. And the preacher will say, the doctor not even in the picture, it all goes to show one thing, it's a wrong motive. And we know that each of those professions does good, for we hear of people that are helped. And if the hearts of the people are right, we would lock arms and hearts with each other and pull our efforts together to try to help our fellow man to make life's journey a little more pleasant to him. But it's money. If the operation is performed, the doctor may be out of uh, giving his pill, it's the vice versa, and to each one, and each denomination thinks if they say something good about the evangelists of the other denomination, it will hurt them. Oh, it's the motives. We ought to have the right type of motive to try to mm -hmm. help our fellow man. Jesus said, if you do not love your brother who you have seen, how can you love God who you have not seen? And I believe that if we could put our efforts together and pray and help and pray with everything that we can, it would make life more pleasant for all of us. And God would bless us more. Now, but we find out that those things exist. And Jesus was upbraiding those people and tried to condemn them, which he did condemn them. And the many places where his outstanding miracles were performed, he said, Oh, go unto you, Capernaum which is exalted into the heavens, shall be brought down to hell, and there's not even a sign of it today. And every city that he predicted that would be cast, every one of them is in ruin today. And the one that he blessed is still standing today. His words are infallible. They are the words of God. Then he turns and says, why didn't they believe the sign that was given them? Now God, through all ages, has always had signs and gifts to men. In the days of Moses, it was in the days of Noah, in every generation, 
He's had gifted men that done signs and wonders among the people. Now, if you notice in the days of Moses, how that they refused to hear Moses because they said, Why? Who made you a judge over us? And for their penalty of unbelief, they were granted 40 years more of punishment because they would not hear Moses. And after they'd already seen signs and wonders that had been done among them, every one of them but Joshua and Caleb was refused to see the promised land and all died in the wilderness. It's a terrible thing to think of unbelief. Your eternal destination rests upon your faith, and your actions speak so loud that your words can't be heard. Your attitude towards the things of God. Notice, he gave a very striking statement here. He said, The queen of the south, which was of Sheba, shall rise up in the generation in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the utmost parts of the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now, in the day God had chosen a man by election, Solomon, and him being king, and with the gift, the people accepted it because they almost were compelled to do it. He was the king. In Moses' time, they did not want to accept it. In Noah's time, in Elijah's time, they did not want to accept it. And when God sends a gift, now I want you to get it. When God sends a gift, he will vindicate that gift. And if the people will receive it, they've got a right to test it, to look it over like Nathaniel did and as women as well in different places. But when it's proven to be from God, then if the people reject it, there's nothing left but chaos. And if the people receive it, it will be a golden jubilee for that people. They will receive it, but it all lays to the people. God does his part. Then if he sends the thing, it's up the people to receive it or to reject it. And each one as an individual, not because of your church standing, but as an individual, it doesn't lay within your church accepts it. It's whether you accept it. Salvation is a personal work. It's a personal faith. Not a universal faith. Church faith, but a personal faith in the Lord Jesus. No matter if father don't believe and mother don't believe, it's what you believe. And notice, when they did sign, receive it, then great signs and wonders and jubilee broke out. But when they rejected it, then darkness and gross darkness come to the people and all people of this last day can't you see why gross darkness is falling in this on this country? The gospel of Christ has been rejected. You don't want to believe that, but it's a noted fact. It's the truth. It's too bad, but it's the truth. And I think that if that be the case, each one of us should take inventory of our own experience and our own standings with God and see how we stand in his sight. Not by any tradition, not by be any mental workup but by in that close hidden communion not because of our intellectual conception of his creed or the creed of the church or even of the knowledge that we had with the word for some people knows the word real well but don't know the author moses knew the word real well but that blessed hiding place was it not ridiculous to see moses standing in a king's court with all the celebrity with the finest of language trained in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians and smart, but God had to take him out behind the mountain for 40 years. God's schooling is always right. God schools his man. And remember, as a tr trained as an Egyptian, a sheep herder was an abomination. And it wasn't uh, it's strange to see how foolish it would seem in the hearts of men with wisdom, with a man with all of his great intelligence and with all the great armies of Egypt laying at his command that he would could do whatever he wished to and would step away from his education, step away from his worldly wisdom, step away from his great associates and go out behind the desert to become into abomination to the people that he once associated with. May I say this with reverence, it's tonight that when God calls men, many times he has to step out of the political ranks, out of the social ranks and walk out into a place if it would be necessary, if his associates had to say he's gone crazy or become a holy roller, but it's that secret place, it's that spot. Oh, don't miss it, my loyal friends. Every one of you has received Christ of all your teachings, your fine pastors and your great affiliations with your churches, which is all right. Don't misunderstand me, but you're trying to place that before this. But that little time that God gets you away from all your associates, gets you way back in the corner, brings you into a place, it's a, in a secret place, where that the world, 
the wisdom of the world becomes so insufficient to where all the education that you ever had doesn't mean nothing into that divine presence till the last of the eye gets so dim you can't see it anymore until the love of money is completely vanished away from you and when you stand there alone with jehovah god that's the thing that counts that's the things that make you forget all you ever knew that's where moses had to get and what a beautiful picture god revealing himself there in a burning bush and moses knowed more about god in five minutes in the presence of that burning bush than he'd learned 40 years in egypt that's the place to be alone with god the next day on his road to egypt to deliver egypt or israel out of egypt with his wife sitting on a mule with a little child under each arm and the long whiskers blowing and a stick in his hand going down the road screaming at the top of his voice someone said moses where are you going i'm going down to egypt to take over a one-man invasion going against the greater in number than all the world had the chariots the horsemen and the spearmen and the bowmen of egypt and a little old wrinkled up 80 year old man with a stick in his hand and the white whiskers blowing going down to egypt to take over and the thing of it was he did it because he had been alone with god there's where the church needs tonight is not some fantastic not some new denomination but to be alone with god oh all selfishness all malice all fear all unbelief just fades away from god becomes preeminent there it is that's what makes a person different that's what made moses different that's what makes you different when he went down that time with a vision not with his education he could have called more people together with his education than he could with his gift but israel was ready then to receive and they did now and what did they do they were led out into the wilderness and led across Jordan to the promised land what a marvelous thing now jesus was exhorting them in saying the queen of sheba the queen of the south come from the utmost parts of the world to hear the wisdom of solomon god had a gift had give a gift that that gift was manifested and when god ever gives a gift he manifests it and perhaps maybe it become known throughout the world of them days of solomon's gift the nations begin to learn of it great things begin to take place and all the people with one heart and one accord begin to yes lord we thank you because we see this gift made real and surely then that jehovah is still for us and if he'll send us a gift like that so after israel was convinced they never separated into halves but with one accord they give witness to the gift and then the outside world begin to hear of it and everyone who passes by somebody testified and said oh jehovah is with us for he has given us a great gift in our day and we all rally around it and we are more prosperous than we ever were and that was the golden age of the jews oh how he has blessed us physically spiritually financially he'll always do it if you rally around him his god notice after a while way down in sheba the farthest place of the known world a little queen had this message perhaps everyone that passed through the land heard of it would come by and say you know what there's a great gift in operation up in israel oh it is a wonderful gift you should see it and as she was kept hearing one after one testifying without one flaw in it faith cometh by hearing hearing of the word of god faith cometh by hearing now if one said oh it's a good thing the other saying there's nothing to eat then people was confused but when with one accord they all give witness everybody's passing by told her oh there's a great gift up there you should see it it's a marvelous it can discern oh their god must be the great one only lord it isn't it too bad that we americans can't give witness to the one true god but instead of that we want to make him methodist or he isn't god we want to make him pentecost or he was, wasn't god we want to make him apostolic or he isn't god he's god regardless of our creeds see he's god because he's eternal god but we say we won't go to that arena why we don't believe in no such stuff as that i think it will just as good as what philip told nathaniel when nathaniel said 
how could there be anything good from come from a place like that he said come and see that's the best way to be convinced read the scriptures find out come see for yourself the bible said prove all things and hold fast to that was good prove it by the bible now this little woman 800 years before nathaniel did this she said i'll go for myself that's the way that's the idea i keep hearing i keep hearing the people passing through my kingdom and telling these things i must go see for myself blessed are ye ye are the salt of the earth said jesus what does the salt do salt makes thirst and when you are really you are salty for christ god creates a thirst to the outside world but if the salt has lost its savior it's henceforth good for nothing but to be trod under the foot of men well there's nothing that i never had such arguments and fusses among them there surely can't be nothing about it just to be trod under the foot of men but with one unity we all give one voice to the resurrection and to christ if i be lifted up i'll draw all men unto me notice now as we see this queen enthusiasm begin to rise what was it god was dealing with her now she was a pagan in sheba she was a pagan an idol worshiper but she heard of a living god that could produce something now not a declaration of truth but a living god that had given a gift to prove that he was a living god so it created a thirst and i want you to notice what that little woman had to go to get to him now if you'd take your map and map out now she didn't come across the desert in an air conditioned cadillac she had to come on camels you know to get to christ is no flower bed of ease it isn't going just going up and they sign your name on a book and say well i'm a member of this church from now on you don't come that way it costs something that is a surrendered heart to the will of god sometimes it costs you your friends it will if they are worldly friends but he that will not forsake even his own and follow me is not worthy to be called mine it costs something so she made ready and with the journey of camels it's taken her at least three months to come from sheba across the burning desert to find out whether that gift was right or not no wonder jesus said she'll raise up at the day of judgment and condemn this generation what will it do to saskatoon in the day of judgment he said she come from the utmost part of the world three months on camels to hear the reason of solomon and that greater than solomon is here and they were condemning him listen now not only that but she had to prepare for other things remember the sons of ishmael the arabs on the desert and they were robbers and uh, on, not only did she prepare to come and see for herself but she also prepared to support it if it was right what attitude did you come in she brought in laden camels full of gold and silver and frankincense and mar and royal spices which never compared with on the earth what she had she was first coming to be convinced and if she was convinced then she was going to support it with everything she had we are not willing hardly to come the second night and oh well to support something my that's out of the picture but oh i couldn't do that then what will it be in our generation now notice god's obligated to send his sign that's what they are talking about god's obligated to send his sign and vindicate it and then you're obligated to believe it blessed be the lord god you're solemnly obligated to believe it it tells the nature of you whether it is or not i do not mean to be rude but brethren the time has come where we can't pet anymore we got to preach and the word is sharper than a two-edged sword that cuts even to the marrow of the bone and the design of the thoughts of the heart the word she come prepared and now look what a hard trial the devil was putting all kind of scares in front of her the sons of ishmael the arabs will rob you they were robbers and the devil would say to you they're going to get off in some fanaticism don't you do it you get into some error it will rob you of your experience if you try it that's just the very words of the devil today but the woman was determined she knew 
if it was truly the son of God and God's gift, God was obligated to show it to her. For she hungered to see it. She went anyhow, no matter what anybody else said, what the eunuch said, or what her advisor said. She had her own personal feelings that she wanted to find out. I wonder what your advisors would do. I wonder what the people would say at the church if they knew you were sitting here tonight. I might be criticized. Your name might be took from the book. But if you are determined to find out whether it's the truth or not, God bless you. God's obligated to show you that Christ is raised from the dead, is alive tonight, and he isn't accepted by mental consumption. He is accepted by the new birth, born again, and you become a part of God. I give unto them eternal life. And that word eternal life comes from the word Zoe, which means God's own life. And you can no more perish than God could perish because he has accepted you and adopted you into his family and you are a part of him. Oh, there you are. That makes a difference. How do you know that you are? Then this sign shall follow them that believe. Then you can believe the supernatural. Then you could open your eyes of understanding. You can see the gospel unfolding around you. Then first you must accept it. Then you are born again. Then you... The sons of Ishmael, the Arabs, will rob you. They were robbers. And the devil will say to you, you are going to get off in some fanaticism. Don't you do it. You will get into some error. It will rob you of your experience if you try it. That's just the very words of the devil today. But the woman was determined. She knew if it was truly the son of God and God's gift, God was obligated to show it to her. For she hungered to see it. She went anyhow, no matter what anybody else said, what the eunuch said or what her advisor said. She had her own personal feelings that she wanted to find out. I wonder what your advisors would do. I wonder what the people would say at your church if they knew you were sitting here tonight. It might be criticized. Your name might be took from off the book. But if you are determined to find out whether it's the truth or not, God bless you. God is obligated to show you that Christ is raised from the dead, is alive tonight, and he isn't accepted by a mental conception. He is accepted by new birth, born again. And you become part of God, I give unto them eternal life, and that word eternal life, which comes from the word Zoe, which means God's own life, and you can no more perish than God could perish, because he has accepted your, you and adopted you in his family, and you are part of him, and oh, there you are, that makes a difference. How do you know that you are? Then this sign shall follow them that believe. Then you can believe in the supernatural. Then you can open your eyes of understanding. You can see the gospel unfolding around you then. First, you must accept it. Then you are born again. Then you become a new creature. So she come across the desert. As she got closer, her anticipation began to rise. The devil said, now, what if it isn't so? Well, she said, I've at least made an effort. If I don't see one thing, then I'll make this my God, that I made an effort, but if she come and the gift is true and really of God, God's obligated to prove it. So she entered the course of Solomon, and as she did, she went up and now look, she never come just for one night, she come to stay the whole meeting through. She was going to see it through, she was going to stay until she was convinced. She brought her maids and her eunuchs and everything right with her in her little hand band. And she unloaded right out in the palace court there. She unloaded the camels and things. And she said, now I'll go and sit in the meetings and I'll watch. And I'll see for myself if it is of God. Then if it is, I'm going to accept it. And she watched Solomon as he, the people, were brought before him. And his great gift of discernment proved as very 100% every time. Hallelujah. I know you think I'm beside myself. Maybe I am. If it is, I've... Uh, lost my earthly possessions and my earthly treasures and laid them up in heaven in Christ and she said I'll watch it and as she seemed it come before the great 
mighty gift, not the man, it was just a man, but she watched that gift of God and she saw it time after time as it worked perfectly. And when she got ready to go, she went up to Solomon and she said, All that I have had has been right. The more than I every had is right. There you are, it's all the truth. Now I'm going to support it. And she poured in the cinnamons and the spices and the rich treasures, just as you would when you say, if it's the truth, I want it. Then pour in every treasure that you've got, all your heart, all your soul, all your love, all your devotion, all your thoughts, all your songs, everything that you have, give it to Christ. If he is truly the Son of God and has raised from the dead, support it with everything you are, support it so you become the salt salty until the people of your community will see if there ever was a change, it's in that person. There, there you are. If I'm ever a Christian, I want to be like that man or woman, for they have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, patience, meekness, and so forth. The nine fruits of the Spirit dwells within them. They're not so easily provoked. You can't make them mad at you. They will not become angry. They're so loving that in their very presence, you feel Christ. There you are. There you are. That's what the church needs. Not because you can argue a religion standpoint. That doesn't mean it. It's your life that proves what you are. And what's proved what God was when he came down, it was his grace that proved that he was a God of grace to visit the children of Israel. But it was his divine holiness that required Moses to take off his shoes because the occupant of the house that he came from proved that it was a holy place and God is holy. And it showed that his divine love and grace brought him to his people. And it showed his holiness that Moses had to cover his face and take his shoes off to stand in his presence. Certainly it does. Your life proves what you are by the fruit you bear. Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. Not because they can make religious standpoints. Not because they belong to the best church. They are in the best standing in the church. They are the best in the community. But what they are, a life and that alone. Then a character like that, when that woman had received it, and said, I believe everything that I have seen, it is true, and God is real, and she accepted it. Then Jesus said about her, hundreds of years later, he said, she will raise up in the day of judgment, and would condemn this generation, for she came and stayed and looked with an honest heart, and believed, and when she was convinced, she accepted it, being a pagan. And here you, self-righteous, church-going hypocrite, said, you stand here, look at on me, and call me Beelzebub. And, Master, we seek a sign from you. Said, the sign will be given to you as Jonas raised from the whale's belly, so shall the man of man, son of man will lay in the heart of the earth. And then I say this, friend, when he was here on earth, he was the greatest sign that was ever brought to the earth. I'm closing with this, listen. And they laughed at him when he designed their thoughts and so forth and said he was a specialist, a fortune teller, brother, the chief of the devils. And Jesus said, you speak that against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven you. But when a greater yet comes, when the Holy Spirit is come, and you speak a word against that, it will never be forgiven you in this world or in the world to come. So I wonder what this generation will answer at the Day of Judgment, when the Queen of Sheba stands there, and when the Apostles stand there, and when all the redeemed stand there, and this adulterous and sin-loving church, going, pleasure-seeking generation stands in the presence of God and he witnesses his resurrection here before the judgment and you have to stand what will you say then I wonder and while they're thinking let us pray now Heavenly Father this is the eternal word and I realize that I'm no more a boy but I've got a few years or days or whatever is determined in your mind for me I wish to surrender everything to thee and tonight most holy God as I stand in thy presence and plead for my own self and these people Will thou cover us with thy blood and take away our iniquity and our unbelief and grant unto us tonight favor and revelation to believe with all of our heart and let us who has professed so long and belong to the church and trying to say, well, we belong to such and such a church. We have shouted, we have been baptized a certain way. We have been sprinkled. We belong to the greatest church. We have spoken with tongues or we have danced in the spirit and still with those kind of a spirits that doesn't bear the fruit and the love of Christ, O oh God, forgive us of our iniquity and be our judge tonight, Lord, and judge us as our faith reaches thee 
and pleads for mercy and confessing our sins and knowing that we could not stand in thy presence, but only by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And grant then, Father, tonight that you will give your presence to us and thy grace to us and forgiveness of our sins in thy presence and help us and give us understanding and operate, Lord, through the humble little way that your servant has been doing according to your grace to the people. And as a revelation struck me a few weeks ago how to pray for the people while on the North American continent, those who could not by faith reach out as they do in other lands, I pray that you will help me tonight to understand and the people to understand and get glory and heal the sick and save the lost. For we ask it in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. The Lord bless you, my dear people. And I'm going to ask for a solemn thing. I am undertaking something here from this platform tonight that I have never did before. It is a revelation that came recently, and now as it unfolds, I give it a little try last night to see if I could snap from the discernment as I brought the people to the platform one by one. How many was here last night and seen and believe across the nation? If I should die this night, my testimony of Christ is true. The first thing the Christian world knows it, the Bible teaches it, the Bible promises it, so the Christian world knows it. And right here, humbly saying, that picture baffled the whole scientific world, they know it. There is the picture of the same angel of God that led the children of Israel, the pillar of fire, and his presence is here, not with me, but him. Wasn't Moses, but it was Christ. Now it's up to you. I've laid every bit of it right on the scripture. Now I'm asking God tonight. It's always been a strange thing. Manager after manager has even quit me because that he'd say, Brother Branham, the people go away and are not prayed for. I said, well, brother, in the meetings overseas, but oh, Brother Branham, you're not overseas. He said, pass them through and pray for them. If you do that, they say nothing said was said to me. See, no anointing. I wasn't prayed for. Oh, my office is crowded. And you just feel like going overseas and staying till Jesus comes. But yet the other day, the Lord by his grace gave me revelation. I've tried to just take two or three here on the platform, pray for them. I say, all right. Now the rest of them, I'll just pray for them. Let them come by and I'll pray for them. That's what he told me to do, but I've never been able to do it. When I have discernment, catch one, two, then it's on me. Just might as well stay with it. But he promised me, how many knows that's true? They seen me try it after an hour, after hour, and fail. Because when the anointing strikes, it was there. But the other day in Maine, with Leo and Jean, he promised me that I could do it. And that's why... Tonight I'm standing solemnly on what he promised. Last night, do you notice after the sermon was over, something said to me, now you are weary. You must leave. And Billy come to take me out. Then something in my heart said, stand there. Dismiss that church. In a few moments it was over and I was dismissing the church. Went away feeling fine instead of weak. So the Lord has promised me and I know he'll do it. Now, I want to know how many in the meeting here tonight does not have a prayer card and wants to be prayed for. Raise up your hands. I want those who does not have prayer cards. All right. Now, I want to ask you something. Jesus Christ, the Bible said, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? St. John, that was Hebrews 13, 8. In St. John 14, 7, he said, He that believeth on me, the work that I do, shall he also. Then a woman passed through the crowd once and touched the hem of his garment and went off and sat down. The multitude was thronging him. He said, Who touched me? And even Peter rebuked him, said, Well, Lord, the whole multitude is touching you. He said, But I got weak, virtue went from me. Strength went from the Son of God by one woman touching. Then people wonder, Why don't you stand there hour after hour? Well, you couldn't do it, certainly not. Now, don't be shut up, but look at the scripture. Look at the angel on the pool. The first was stepping in with faith. All the virtue of the angel left, maybe for two months before it came back again. Another season, it was again. Then we wonder what it is. It's God's grace that I ever stood 10 mi minutes or 5 minutes as a sinner saved by grace. But it's God's goodness before destruction strikes the nation. It's God's goodness to the people. Now, I've asked him tonight before we have anybody on the platform. 
to send his great holy angel, which is the one who gives his ornament out into this audience anywhere, and to bring up somebody who touches his garment. And if he has been here on earth, and they touched his garment, and he recognized who it was, and turned around and said, maybe somebody touched me. Now, he didn't know who it uh, was it, or who did it. He said, somebody touched me. Peter said, all of them touching you, Lord. He said, but I perceive that I've got weak. And he looked around. He had discernment. How many of you believe that? Sure. He had discernment. And he looked around until some way, a secret of his own, the father showed him who the woman was. When his eyes fastened down on that one little woman, she couldn't hide herself any longer. He knew who she was, what she'd done, what she'd taken place. He said, thy faith has saved thee. And after she'd even denied it, she was scared. Then she came and fell down and said, Yes, Lord. He said, Daughter, be of a good courage. Thy faith has saved thee. Saved thee the word, the same word, sozo. Every time, physically or spiritual, some same atonement, um, same man, same day, but by his stripes we were healed. He was wounded for transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. Same thing. Now the Bible said that is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of infirmities right now. How many believe that's the truth? Right now, he's the high priest. He's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on the throne of God, making intercessions on our confession, not on our mental workup, but our real confession. Now, if he will manifest his presence in this audience tonight, and there's not one person in this audience that I know but Brother Solomon here, and Sister Saltman and the family, Brother Norman and Sister Norman, and that little group of people about three rows back, my daughter-in-law, son, that's all that I know. And you know how many here that knows that I don't know you or nothing about you, raise your hand. I don't care who you are, raise your hand, knows I don't know nothing about you, certainly I do not. Now, if Christ is risen from the dead, is more than able and will by his blessed presence.